like. Hey, Ryan, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How you doing? Good, good. Um, so welcome, everybody, uh, to this live AMA. A little bit different, obviously, than some of the ones we've done recently, which happen inside Slack. Um, we've done a few of these over the past year or so. They're always they're always popular. Um, I feel like it just leads to sometimes a more lively discussion. So um, we'll obviously be recording. We'll publish it. Um, actually, we're going to publish it tomorrow. Um, so everyone will have access to it. And um, yeah, let's just let's just get right into it. So today we're going to be talking about B2B podcasting. We've got Ryan Tab, founder of Podsicle Media here. Um, I have a couple just kind of like primer questions. Um, we'll encourage people to use the chat and drop questions, which I'll queue up for Ryan. Um, so anything, anything you want to know about B2B podcasting, please go ahead and drop it in there. I want this to be like, it'd be great if we could talk about like actual, like really practical, uh, challenges you're bumping into as you're and your team are thinking through this kind of thing. So, okay. I'll stop talking. Ryan, do you mind just giving us a quick intro of yourself and tell us a little bit about Podsicle? Yeah, sure. So, uh, I'm Ryan Tab. I'm the founder of Podsicle Media and, uh, we're a B2B podcast production agency. So for companies that want to start podcasts and don't have the capacity or the expertise in house to do that, uh, we come in and we help them from show launch to finding the right concepts and assets for the show and everything. And then getting into ongoing production services where we're turning it into micro content like videos and, and things like that. So, um, not to make it too much of a, of our like sales pitch, but that's what we do, you know, and, and I, uh, I've been podcasting for a decade and, um, I was in market research before that. So I feel like I've got a pretty good grasp on this, just learning the marketing world more as I go in the last few years. And that's been really interesting for me. Super cool. You know, one of the things, when we first met, one of the things you said to me was that, um, it's easy to start a bad podcast. Could you kind of like uh, yeah. elaborate on that a little bit? Because like my experience starting a podcast is that it was easy and it was also bad. So yeah, I, that's kind of that's kind of my like my go to buzz phrase is just it's easy to start a bad podcast. That's why everyone does it. Um, there's so much bad podcasting content out there, and it's really easy to produce, which is I think why people fall into that trap. It tends to be marketing priority, you know, B or C. It's never you know A on the list, and so when you get it done, that's like the biggest accomplishment. If you're already, you know, working in what's a relatively, um, you know, overworked environment already, or you have a lot of marketing responsibilities on your plate. So a lot of companies are just churning out content where it's like, Hey, we sat down, we recorded something and now we're publishing it for the world to see. And that's fine, but it doesn't do much to actually benefit your brand or elevate your brand. I think that's really what I'm getting at with that is like, it's, it's not that hard to record audio content. I mean, yeah. we're doing that right now, right? Like yeah, yeah. You and, I and it's often that. free and sometimes the hosting is free. Yeah. So I there's a lot too, of ways you can just get it out there, but yeah. it takes, it takes a fair amount of work to actually get it right. That's interesting. Cause I feel like once the podcast, like say you, say you record it for free, you host it for free and then it still ends up on Spotify and the Apple podcasting app. And something about that, I think makes people feel like it's really legitimate, mm -hmm. but it, it might still be terrible. But there's no gatekeepers there, so you can just publish stuff. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's even when I get on my, my calls with with prospects and the big thing, because I mean, I wear a lot of hats. Obviously, I'm CEO, but I'm marketing and sales and all that. So um, I, they say, oh, well, how are we going to get it distributed? And I said, oh, well, we'll make sure it's on Spotify and, and Apple Podcasts. And like just right there, they get really excited. And I'm like, that's interesting that that's the part that's exciting for you, because that's the the really like I don't even usually talk about it because that's a given. It's it's Yeah, it's, yeah. That's like saying. Yeah, it's like saying you're going to publish your blog post on WordPress. Exactly. Like, how else yeah. are you going to get it out there? Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly um, right. Who, who are your points of contact? Yeah. Like who, who's responsible for podcasting? Like very recently there was a conversation in our Slack group and people said, you know, podcasting is like very top of mind on our content team. Can we start a channel? So we started a channel where people are now talking about podcasting. Still not totally clear to me if it's fully its own discipline within like a larger marketing team or if people who work in content marketing, which is traditionally not multimedia are now being tasked with it because it's like, it's, it's kind of loosely falls under the content umbrella. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I think for really large enterprise organizations, there is better segmenting. And so you have teams that I wouldn't say there's a ton of, very few companies have dedicated podcasting teams. You're looking more at like multimedia teams in general. Um, but for 90% of the companies that I talk with, it's the content lead. So whoever's in charge of content marketing, that's my primary point of contact. And then generally someone within the content 
uh, team is going to be hosting the show as well. So it's primarily a yeah. content responsibility. Although I will say in the last couple of months, there's been an uptick in demand gen leaders getting involved. And then also uh, just executives, because once an executive knows their company has a podcast, or maybe they were behind starting it, they get really excited and want to participate. Okay. Yeah. Can we talk about that for a second? Yeah. Because I, there was, I actually had a conversation with someone recently. I will not mention their name. And they were talking about like, they got this project dumped on their desk and it's a podcast. The CEO wants to build up sort of their own thought leadership profile, but it, it basically devolved into CEO's pet project. Doesn't really fit into like the strategy that the team has already agreed on. Um, you know, it's there, but it's the CEO. So I was like, how do you, say, it's hard to say no, you know, you end up just kind of doing what they want to do. Um, so I guess, I guess the question is like, I have to think that there's a lot of CEOs out there who think if I run a podcast, this will be helpful for the company. So there's like the intent there is good, but if you're the person that gets this project dumped on your desk, Oh, sorry. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We're good. Sorry. I just got a warning that uh, the audio is not working. Um, if you're the person who gets this project dumped on your desk, like how might you suggest kind of steering this project in the right direction or kind of, you know, maybe gently uh, kind of nudging that CEO to like make the pro the project productive and yeah. not, not just like you're doing it just to make them happy. Yeah. I, that's a great question. So I, I think first of all, um, a lot of circumstances where it does become that second and dreaded option where it just is to make the CEO happy, those fall apart pretty quickly anyway, because CEOs are super busy. They get excited. It's a pet project, like you said. And then four episodes in, they're like, I don't have the time for this. And it just dies. So yeah. that's beyond any of like the actual opportunities to provide value. The fact that it just won't survive is a good enough reason to avoid that in the first place. And it's honestly just not how most people want to spend their days at work anyways, kind of satisfying that, that, um, that CEO pet project. But as far as actually putting together something that is going to be productive, and I was going to get into this a little bit with like the broader state of B2B podcasting. Um, the beautiful thing about podcasting is you don't have to bow down to uh, Google search rankings. And so when it comes to writing- That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, so when you're writing blog content, you're constantly trying to balance how can we provide something actually valuable for the audience mm -hmm. and how can we make sure that Google is going to show that to our audience. With podcasting, the distribution is a lot more organic. And so if you imagine it like writing blog posts, if you never had to worry about search engine optimization, how would you write? And the real answer is you would only record as much as you could actually, or you'd only write as much as you could provide value in. And everything you say would be supposed to be really useful for the people who are reading it. And I would approach podcasting the same way. Uh, there's no need to write the equivalent of a thousand word blog post if 500 words gets it done. So a lot of companies have 30 minute podcasts and that's great. Um, a lot of companies are trending that way, but for a while it was like, everybody does an hour. So we'll do an hour. And then yeah. this thing goes with like not having to worry about, worry about keyword stuffing on the blog side. How are we actually putting things out there that are going to impact our listeners in a way that we want them to associate with our brand? And if that like ethos for the show is really strong and you hold on to that and ask yourself that at pretty much every opportunity that you can, where you're creating something new, whether it's a show asset or an episode or finding a guest, you'll, you'll, you'll get 90% of the way there just with that. Yeah. That's beautiful. Actually, that makes me so like happy to hear. I mean, I guess like, you know, as a frequent podcast podcast listener, you often hear hosts being like, you know, leave us a five-star rating or like drop a review. I mean, in that sense, they're trying to optimize for an algorithm, but like at a show level, yeah, not an episode level, exactly. which is really different because if it, yeah, like on the blog post level, people trying to optimize that it's like, it can lead you kind of in the wrong direction and, and you're you're trying to motivate your listeners so the other thing is if if blogs if google respected the fact that readers could say hey this was really helpful then maybe you wouldn't have to do as many things within the content itself to satisfy mm. that if it was just based off reviews from your readers or in this case from your listeners so that's the other thing you don't i mean you can ask for that and you can still satisfy the algorithm without mm. modifying your content or really if you want to get the best results from your listeners modifying your content in the way that it's the most useful for them yeah. Um, super interesting. There's a couple questions, which uh, there's some overlap in too. Um, one is how do you measure uh, and enhance podcast reach? And yeah. another is tracking the impact of a podcast is so difficult. What metrics do you recommend as the best way to show results, individual streaming services, site traffic, et cetera? Yeah. Great question. So um, I think as far as measuring results, before we get into like measuring the actual impact and statistics, if we're just talking about like marketing KPIs, the big thing at the beginning is figuring out uh, 
what your primary goal is going to be. So for some companies, that's lead generation and demand generation. And then for others, they want to establish a stronger community. So maybe through their community, um, if you have some type of developer network where people are building tools, it might result in people sticking around and building on your platform more. And would that show up in your sales? Maybe not, but that would show up in your community KPIs. If it's marketing, if it's demand gen, if it's those kinds of things, uh, then I think the primary opportunities uh, are to accelerate sales cycles and to build trust. So you want to always have an opportunity for people to um, let you know where they're coming from. You don't want to rely on attribution software all the time because a lot of times people will listen to your show, Google it. I mean, I don't need to tell this to everybody. Everybody in this in this context uh, knows about the dangers of software-based and really strict lead attribution. But as long as you're getting that information, then the rest of it shows up in places like if you have a complicated B2B SaaS product and you need to build tons of trust, say you're in cybersecurity, um, you're going to have people who get on a sales call, they get a demo, they go through, and then a week later, they listen to your podcast. And that can be a deciding point for them in realizing, okay, this company does what they're talking about. They understand my specific dilemma and the thing I need a solution for. I'm getting back on that second call or I'm replying to that follow-up message from their sales team. So it really works. Um, it's really intertwined with a lot of the sales process, I think, in bringing people closer to close. Although the other opportunity that most people look at it for is the top of funnel content, which is just like stuff you're going to see on social media and building brand mm -hmm. awareness. That part is a huge aspect of it, but that almost happens regardless of how you optimize and direct your content. So that's the part that takes care of itself and really focusing on driving the outcomes is, is maybe the other the other aspect. I hope that answered that for the, uh, for the KPIs element of it. But for tracking, um, I mean, look, this is... I love podcasting. Obviously, if I didn't, I wouldn't be doing what I do. Um, but that is far and away the biggest weakness of the medium. It is inherently difficult to track. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because uh, the way RSS feeds are structured, the way podcasting is structured, it is a push medium. So when you record a podcast, your platform is pushing all of that to the listening uh, outlets. So it's getting pushed to Spotify and Apple. And that happens regardless of whether or not anybody on those platforms is asking for the content. So then those platforms can record that there's download requests to specifically subscribe to those and they can self-report that back to your platform, which is great. And that happens, but nothing is happening the way other content gets tracked where you're only getting engagement, where people request engagement, they click through on your link and they're looking for it. So it's, it's really difficult because it gets put out there and you don't have to necessarily um, wait for people to request it. And then you'd be able to track it if that was the way it went. So the way we work around that primarily, and there's a few software solutions. I actually had a call with an awesome company today uh, called Casted. And they're like building out some really, really great tools for identifying listeners and stuff like that. But the way we work around that right now, and the way most of the industry works around that, set up um, a self-hosted web page. So your listening platform will give you usually um, a, a hosted web page for your podcast. That's great. And you can track the visits to that, but put something on your website. And if you're using enrichment tools, if you're using Clearbit or something like that to identify the visitors at your site, identify who's visiting that page. And you'll know that those are the people listening to your podcast. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And you'll know which prospects, which repeat visitors are engaging with that kind of content. And you can track them through the CRM then and how that affects the, the process. That's cool. Actually, I, I just recently installed the Clearbit weekly visitor report thing on our Google Analytics. And it's yeah, really it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just playing around with the free version because I was curious to test it out. But like, you know, if you're a big organization, you've got a sales team of five or 10 people or more, like you should definitely be using a tool like that. It was very insightful to see like at a page level, who, what companies, what, and what, what people and what companies do they represent that are hanging out on your website? Um, exactly. Super, super interesting. I wonder, um, you know, I guess I wonder in your experience, like one of the questions, like uh, when I was doing sales at a content agency, like you sort of get this classic question of like, well, how do I prove ROI? And it's like, I can't, I can give you an answer, but it's like such an imperfect, it depends type of answer, you know, based on your business and what's your runway, like what are your expectations? What do you want to get out of this? It's like, it's really difficult. I, was, I assume you get questions like that. Yeah. Um, how do you, well, I guess, and one other thing I'll throw at you, one thing that I found was like, some companies are just super bought into content marketing 
and like they're they just get how it works and they feel very confident that by investing in it and doing a good job that it will pay off over time. And then other companies view it as a channel and they want to know, well, with my other channels, I put in X dollars and I get Y back. Can you tell me that? And like, not like, no, not, not really. You know, like how, yeah. how do you feel that question? How should people be thinking about that? Because you might get that question internally too. Yeah. You know? It's it's a great, it's a great point. Um, I answer that question a little differently when I'm on a sales call versus like what I would encourage somebody who's already in an organization and maybe they want a podcast, but they're trying to sell the idea to senior leadership. So when I get that question on sales calls, the primary thing I want to do is remind people that uh, it is not a trackable medium like PPC would be. And I think that the proliferation of PPC and social media advertising in the last decade has really changed expectations. Um, and, and people are looking for directly attributable ROI. Am I getting exactly three times what I put out? Which is great. If you could rely on that at all aspects of your marketing, that'd be wonderful. Um, but that's just not really how things work. So I try and remind people of that. And the best way we're going to measure this is the feedback they're getting from their customers, uh, is the way it affects the sales cycle and the amount of content that they get to distribute. Um, and then the other big aspect that's like a, a selling point for a lot of companies where they realize it is, is having other industry influencers on your show and associating with your brand. So this is again, part of what I was planning to say about the change in the industry, but guests are way more comfortable now than they were before. If we were doing guest outreach two years ago, the mm -hmm. feedback we'd usually get is like, oh, it sounds interesting, but I don't know if I'm ready for that. I'm a little nervous. I've never done a podcast. Guest outreach today, people reply quickly and they're like, hell yeah, I'm interested. I want to be on your show. And so they come ready to talk about things that are on their mind. And then they go to their network and they share that. So it's a huge reach opportunity because you're going to speak with people who I mean, you can get people on your podcast that your company would otherwise have no way to reach. Like it's, it's really impressive. I have, I have uh, contact points at companies now that I have no other way I could imagine getting a reply from them. And I feel like them, uh, that, that uh, them and us have like a pretty good working kind of professional relationship that I could message them and get a reply back within 24 hours. So like the impact is huge when it comes to building those relationships and then having those people share your content. Um, the kind of example there is I had um, Yale Miller, who is the content lead at monday.com on my podcast when we were very new to launching that particular show within our organization and monday.com shared it on their LinkedIn page. Like that's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. a multi-billion dollar company sharing our podcast. You just don't get that from blog posts. You don't get that from a lot of other mediums. Yeah. Um, so they have a vested interest in promoting the content and the, content is associated with your brand. That's a huge win. Um, yeah. Hope that answered it. That was kind of a rambling answer. But. Yeah, that's no, good. That's good. Uh, we have a couple other questions in the chat I wanted to get to. One is, um, what do you feel makes podcasts succeed? Good intro, interesting guests, good theme running through the show. I, I would imagine those yeah. plus probably many other things. Um, the number one piece of advice I give for every show that we launch is to the best of your ability skip the guest intro everybody like unless they have a really really compelling story unless they were raised by wolves like i i don't want to hear about yeah. their background in marketing because we know who they are today if they didn't have anything relevant to share they wouldn't be on the podcast obviously you want people mm. that have to say hey this is who i am this is what i do but people aren't tuning in to just learn about the background of your guests so your job as a host should be to bring the most out of the conversation every host is going to have a different style that fits them best and it's probably pretty in line with your personality. Are you a great listener? If you're a great listener, spend a lot of time listening to the answers and trying to come up with thought provoking questions that build on what they said, make them feel like what they're saying is valuable and there's more to get out of it. Are you really just like a great talker? Have a, have an intense conversation, you know, get, get some aspects of your personality showing, make them laugh, make them feel comfortable, those kinds of things. So being yourself, being authentic, not worrying too much about perfection and prioritizing, getting something out of the conversation for your listeners are the primary things that make or break a show. The other really easy trap to fall into, and this gets talked about in marketing all the time, and particularly content, is niching down. Uh, that does matter, though, because if you're, uh, say, you you know, you're a um, some type of marketing software, there's enough marketing podcasts out there. What is the disruptive thing that your company provides that is the essence of what you sell your product on, and then how can you frame a show around that to really explain how? one particular approach to attribution is the right way to go about revamping your marketing organization or whatever that sales point is. However you sell your product, that should be 
the theme of the show. And if you're just producing another marketing show or another sales show or another content show, not only are there tons of them out there, there are tons of successful ones out there already. Um, so people aren't looking for that. They're looking for a new way to learn more about a specific thing that they're encountering in their career, because these aren't general, like these are not um, how I built this. These are not the daily from New York times. Yeah, these yeah. are very niche business oriented things. And I think people need to keep that in perspective. We're talking about getting the highest quality engagement and connections with your listeners, not getting the highest listener count. Got it. That makes sense. And I, where does consistency fall into that? Like, yeah, I can't tell you how many content strategies I've seen fall apart, basically from a lack of patience. Like if someone, you know what I mean? If they mm -hmm. just done it a little bit longer, like, is there a tipping point where after kind of X episodes, like it actually starts to build real momentum? Yeah. I mean, so if, if you're doing it right and your listeners are becoming champions of your podcast, they're sharing, they're commenting. Um, obviously that growth is then exponential because the more listeners you have, the more they're going to share your podcast and expose it. So that tends to ramp up at like three to six months for podcasts mm -hmm. that are on the right track. If it takes a little bit more iteration at the beginning, it can take six to eight months. If it, if it takes you a while to hit your stride and find what I call podcast market fit. Um, so yeah, I like that. that's, uh, I, I got all the marketing terms I've come up with all the buzz, yeah, yeah. all the buzzwords and everything. <laughs> but, um, yeah, if it takes you a little longer to find that, then, then it'll take a little longer to ramp up. I wish there was a, you know, 12 episodes. That's the date, you know, you're going to see the biggest difference, but I wouldn't try and measure anything earlier than three to six months. And in particular, that depends on your production frequency. If you're producing monthly, you might be on the three end of that. If you're producing, or excuse me, if you're producing weekly, you might be on the three month end of that. If you're producing bi-weekly, which is what most companies do, it might be closer to six. So it is a long-term investment. It's a long-term play. And even at three to six months, you're looking at, are we starting to see the results we wanted? Not have we solved like some critical issue that's, that's fixed and we can just call it a day. So yeah. it, it's just starting to see things heading in the right direction and then building on that. Makes sense. We've got a good question here. Um, for those starting a B2B podcast, what are some of, what are some important aspects that may not be top of mind that need to be focused on? And conversely, what are things that people spend too much time on that don't really drive impact? Okay. That's a, that's an awesome question. Um, the number one thing that I think doesn't get focused on enough is show graphics. So you're thinking about, we're going to be booking our oh, guests and we have to host an episode and we have to produce it. And then all that gets done. And you're like, we got to get it on social media. And I just wrote a blog post a few weeks ago about this. There's such a high standard for B2B companies. I, when I, when I go through this process of kicking off a podcast and I'm sending things over for revisions, the amount of people that need to have eyes on it, that need to approve things that want to make tiny little tweaks to every little graphic is humongous. But then when companies do it internally, whoever's on the design team and has the authority to make that approval or, or the content team, they don't apply that same level of scrutiny and focus to their podcasting content. Because I think mm -hmm. it, it, in your head, it's audio visual content. And so if the video and the audio are good, you're set. Build out awesome templates, like take time at the beginning before you launch your show, spend a month perfecting the assets or two weeks, depending on how fast your organization moves and how big of a priority it is, but spend some time perfecting these assets, put them in Canva, export your videos, and then just drag them into Canva into your video template with a frame and then export it. And it makes a world of a difference. I, again, like if we go back to, I feel like all my little salesy phrases are coming up here, but one of the slides in our sales deck says like, we want to build a podcast that elevates your brand, not a podcast that relies on your brand to elevate the show. It's a little mm. less wordy than that. I like that. But, but yeah, that's yeah. the idea. Um, it just, it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. The graphics that some of these companies put out are so excellent on everything they do except podcasting. They throw a video up on the screen with a color block background and comic sans. It's not comic sans, but <laughs> as the caption, you know, it's like, yeah, hold yourself to that standard across the organization, including podcasting. I think that's where I'd stress most companies go wrong at the beginning. Um, and then just don't, don't produce more than you need to for the sake of producing content. Like don't pressure yourself into putting out empty episodes that don't have value. But at the same time, we, we were just talking about this consistency matters. So find a consistency at the beginning and you can adjust as you get started that matches the amount of quality content you can put out. There are some companies that don't write that many blog posts, but they do really in-depth stuff. If that's the way your company operates, maybe it makes sense to publish one podcast a, mo podcast a month. If you're a company that is just a content machine, yeah, maybe weekly is better. But if you're that monthly company, don't stress yourself to be weekly because you're going to be putting out bad content. Somebody's going to listen to that. And I'll tell you what, they're not going to click on the future ones that they see that might be really good. Mm, right. 
Um, can I throw a situation at you? Curious yeah. what you think about this. I have a friend who started a podcast last summer, not B2B. He started a trail running podcast. So it's kind of like it's for enthusiasts of this kind of niche sport. And we talked about it beforehand. And he said, I'm going to try and do a hundred episodes in the first year. And I was like, dude, that's crazy. Like you should do it slower, more slowly. So you could kind of like hone it in, like figure out what works, what doesn't. And he was like, he, his thing was like, I have no Twitter followers, no email subscribers, no nothing. I'm just going to go on a blitz so that you can't ignore me. Um, so 13 months later, he's on 125 episodes. It's like a crazy amount of podcasts. Uh, but now like I see like his Twitter is, is like crazy. Like all these professional runners, like comment on his stuff and like his newsletter is growing really quickly. Is there something there, you know, like maybe, maybe in the B2B space, I think we tend to be a little more cautious. Like, let's get this right. It's, you know, we're sort of representing the brand as we do this. It's not just, it's not just that like kind of lone wolf person out doing it, you know? Um, so, I mean, I guess my question there is like, uh, it's hard to break in, right? Like it's hard yeah. to start building your audience. Like maybe a blitz would work for some people if it's like a super personality driven thing and kind of more of like a, that lone wolf style for others. Like, do you recommend, I mean, is tw twice a month, like kind of the right cadence for the B2B company, but also the B2B listener, you know, like, is there enough appetite on the listener side to consume more than that? Yeah. So I, I think that's the, where you ended is the perfect jumping off point for the answer, which is the listener appetite. Um, the content matters. So in like a trail running podcast, I'm sure it's much more about the background of these runners and about the conversations yeah. and the personalities. And so with that, you can pump that up twice a week that there's basically limitless content for him to record. And it's the type of content that people want to listen to B2B, not so much. Like there's, there's only so many actually useful things you can say about a very niche topic. Um, especially when you're not doing the things I said, like digging into the guest background. I mean, if you really wanted to profile them, that might be interesting if someone happens to resonate, but that's not going to help your brand. So two, I find that two a month is the best cadence for companies that aren't all in on content. If you have a massive content arm and you are one of those companies that just gets it with content, weekly is always going to be better. Uh, the, the, the great thing is that podcasts, exist after you finish recording them. That's why they're, I mean, they're not radio shows, right? So if the appetite's not there on Monday and you release on Mondays, people will find it on Tuesdays um, and, and they'll go through your backlog. That's another thing that happens a lot. You find a listener who comes in at episode 37, but then they go back and listen to the 36 episodes before that over the next couple of months. So the biggest thing is that you have to look at it more like building a portfolio rather than making a bunch of like mini broadcasts. Everything that you do is still going to be a part of this bigger folder of podcasts you're creating and promoting and putting out there for the world. So I just wouldn't encourage blitzing unless you don't think that's going to detract from the quality of the content that's permanently going to be sitting there. I mean, you could take it down, but if you're taking it down, then you've done something wrong. So, yeah, yeah. You know, on that note, um, seasons and series. Great question. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is something I, I've been getting a lot lately. Um, I feel like, I wonder if companies sometimes are hesitant to sort of commit to one thing because it feels like once you have like, once you're in the Apple podcast app, like, are you sort of stuck with whatever it is you committed to? And like, or maybe our seasons or series kind of like your, your way to sort of pivot once you're up and running. So this is the number one distinction between show structure for what I would call general interest podcasts and B2B podcasts. You don't need to be serial. You don't need to be episodic if there's nothing about your show thematically that warrants that. So if you're doing something that's narrative driven, which very few B2B brands do, great. Let's set up a series of 10 episodes. Um, if you're doing a series of interviews, let's say they're really not about like a particular aspect of what your company does, but it's truly just about like hearing interesting stories. Okay, let's make that episodic. Let's do 10 episodes in a season. For everybody else where it really is just continuing to have these like public dialogues and get connected with your audience, there's no advantage to, to serializing things or going episodic. So for some teams, I think the appeal is knowing that there's a finish line, but there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with going on hiatus and then just coming back. But this idea that there's season one and season two, but there's absolutely no distinction between them and you just stop producing for a while. Like it, I really think podcasts should be viewed like blogs. It's an audio medium. It's a very different type of conversation, but the concept is similar. You wouldn't, 
serialize your blog unless you're doing a very specific series of topics on how to solve this problem in your organization. And you wouldn't just stop, right. stop, you know, blogging for the summer. It, it doesn't, you know, like it's, it's evergreen content if you're doing it right. And, and I would say, um, maybe this is a little contrarian, but especially in B2B, I would, I would stay away from that unless you are an enterprise company that's putting out narrative driven content that's highly produced, which in that case, you have a ton of ideas of what you're doing already and you don't need my advice. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Super, inter super interesting. We're just about up on time. I, I okay. should have said this at the beginning. This is part one. We're going to do this again. And I feel like there's a lot of demand. We're going to publish the recording, encourage people to check it out, jot down your questions. We'll have them queued up and ready to go for the next time we do this. Um, Ryan, where can people find you? And tell us about your podcast too, because I feel like that seems like a real, like, consuming a podcast about how to do this well seems like a really good way for people to just kind of like get up to speed on a lot of this. Yeah. So um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Ryan Tab, that's me. And you can find Podsicle Media on LinkedIn as well. And our website is podsiclemedia.com. So pretty straightforward stuff there. Um, I will mention the podcast in a second. If I can just add one last little point here. Yeah, of course. We, before we call it for today. Um, one of the thoughts that I had when you were asking me some questions over the last few days is like, where do companies go from here? What does the future of it look like? Um, I still think it's something that's getting on people's radars. So the way I'm getting feedback right now is that some organizations have it as a 2023 line item. Others have it as just like a concept in their head, but there's almost no content teams that haven't thought about it at this point or considered it. So we're kind of on the cusp of like what I would say it becoming fully mainstream. The question of then where would it go from there? I think there's a lot of segmentation between the different types of content that companies produce. So the blog team and the podcast team and the YouTube team and the social team don't necessarily work hand in hand. So that to me is the future of it is creating what's more of a broader media arm. And I know everybody says like become a media company, don't become a media company. You're a B2B SaaS company, but maybe some aspects of your operation could function more like a media company. And in that case, I think operating all those, those aspects of the organization in parallel, covering similar content, building on each other. That's, that's the, future of it. And maybe that's what we dig into uh, with the next AMA. As yeah, for, I love it. As for uh, our podcast, we actually are rebranding our internal podcast. So we were doing a content marketing podcast, but I didn't feel that that was niche enough. So pretty soon here, we're going to be relaunching our B2B podcast podcast, um, <laughs> which is exactly what you were touching on. Um, and when that gets launched, I'll throw it in the promotions channel in Superpath. Um, and Please hopefully do. That'll be, we'll have a few episodes live by the time the next AMA rolls around. Cool. Love it. Love it. And just to be, I want to be super clear with people. If you need help doing this, just, you should get in touch with Ryan because yeah. like having, having tried this for super path, like we're going to do it again and we're going to do it right the next time. Like we did it and we did it poorly. Exactly. Like you said, uh, it wasn't that hard, but it wasn't that good either. So, um, you know, just like so many things with content marketing, it's not that hard to write a blog post, but it is hard to continuously, you know, consistently execute, do all the little things that, that make it good, right? All the distribution stuff, all the artwork, all the, all the guests, all the things that kind of like make it not a headache, make it fun to do, uh, make it, you know, great experience for listeners. So um, would encourage people to check it out. We'll obviously include all of those links for everybody in the recording when we publish and it. feel free to message me in the Slack channel. Like I, I love giving advice. I'm not the kind of person who's like, it's an hour of my time. You got to pay. I mean, you know, if, if there's a fit for our companies to work together, great. But if you guys are doing something internally, like I'd still love to provide my insights and answer any questions. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out if anything comes up or you have in mind. I mean, I really enjoy those types of uh, interactions. Cool. Love it. Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Thanks folks for coming. We'll have a recording out shortly and uh, we'll let everybody know when the next one of these is going to be scheduled. Awesome. Thanks, Jimmy. Cool. Take care. Bye everybody. Bye.